right, everyone, welcome to our second part of the Woman in the Art of Film series. I'm super happy to be joined by Lee Lu, a narrative and documentary and TV directing filmmaker. She has worked um, on many different types of documentary feature films, a feature film, and works as a TV director, which she recently was on the Fox uh, Fellowship and just shot her show, The Resident, which I'm really excited to talk to you about as well. Um, been a part of programs like IFP, Sundance, Firelight Media, and many, many more. I am super honored to be um, speaking to her today. So welcome, Lee. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. Hello, people <laughs> out there. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, so to begin, what I'd like to do is just tell us about your background and how you got to where you are today. Well, you know, my background, I think I got to take it back to when I was growing up in, uh, in Texas, in Sugar Land, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. Um, I was really interested in dance and performance, which was interesting to explore the arts through that avenue because I got interested in music and other things of that sort. Um, and I think that culminated into my passion for film because I realized film was an amalgamation of every kind of art form and expression into one mm. as well. And that led me to think about film school. I uh, went to USC, and which was great. Uh, but after film school, I really thought to myself, I didn't actually know how to make a film. You know, how do I actually get this together? And how do I tell my voice through this medium? So I started to work on set a lot. and. After a couple of years, I was able to work up to the role of the first AD. And I did first AD work for about 10 years mm. on set, you know, learning as much as I could as I, you know, as I kind of went from different kinds of projects, you know, different genres, different sizes of productions to really understand what, hey, what is the language here of making films? Um, and in 2015, I decided that I would make my first feature because uh, I was kind of getting tired of, you know, just being on set and not having as much of a creative role in when you're the first AD. And I decided to make my first feature, my first narrative feature, which, you know, was really hard, had very little money, like, a, you know, most people can say it was their first, uh, first attempts, but that turned out to be really great and successful. And I was able to show it around and, you know, um, connect with audiences with it. And after that, I thought I would be able to, you know, get more narrative projects and whatnot. Um, but then I got interested in documentary when a story uh, very close to my heart uh, happened near my hometown of Sugarland, and that kind of wrapped in, in itself um, and informed my narrative work even more. And so I was able to be able to do more things like TV, as you mentioned. So, yeah, that's kind of my background at that. Oh, that's awesome. You know, I completely <laughs> forgot about the 10 years of AD oh, experience. Okay. Oh, sorry. I muted myself so I wouldn't disrupt you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I completely forgot about the 10 years of AD experience, which yeah. is quite phenomenal that you you went to USC, one of the best film schools in the nation, and then you were you, you kind of basically did a second film school but professionally for 10 years. That's a really long time. And yeah. so can you tell us like being a first AD, explaining what a first AD is because people sure. are not uh, familiar with it and also um, what you what you learned during that experience. So a first AD first off is the person who is on set kind of orchestrating everything. Um, it's the most obvious thing that they're, a, they're in charge of is the schedule of the day, making sure that everyone uh, understands what the day's work is, what the schedule looks like at any point in the day's work. Uh, and I will also emphasize that the first AD is in charge and should be very cognizant of safety at all times, making sure that everyone's doing their job, um, protecting their own health and the safety of others. Um, and also the first AD really, for me, is someone who helps every department and the director and the producer, everybody, do the best they can with what they have. Mm -hmm. And usually the thing that you don't have is time, you know. Uh, and how to sort of mitigate how to use that time to everyone's advantage so that everyone's best work can be shown. And that's, you know, that, that I think is how I approached it. As some people just say, oh, you're just, just a time cop, or you're just there barking orders, this or that. I disagree. I think it's someone that is really there to help serve the creative vision um, within 
the reality of what you have and how much time you have to do it. Um, and safety, I think, is a big thing, too. You are the one to say, hey, this doesn't look safe. I'm not going to shoot it, and I don't think these actors should either or whatever. You're the one to speak up. Um, um, so, yeah, that was my role. And what was your second part of the question? So, I mean, it was basically like a huge school for you, learning experience. What did you oh, learn the most that you took with you as a, a director? I think, you know, in film, film school is great because you get to learn theory. You get to learn, like, what excites you creatively as a filmmaker. You get a sense of how to work together with your student projects and all of that. But I think by doing as much on-set work as I did is I really got to understand how people work together, mm. how human beings work together, you know, how to recognize a personality when there's something like that on set, you know, how do you talk to actors? Actors are very vulnerable. They're put in a very vulnerable position. You know, they have to be very, everything's depending on them, right? The lights are ready, the camera's there, it's quiet, you know, everyone's rolling and they have to do the best they can. So how to protect that. Um, and I think for me, I think I learned, I really, I really, practically learned all I know now from that onset experience, I have to say. And it's different from, you know, that's my path to say there is no one path that's correct, you know. Um, but for me, I felt like I needed to really get my hands dirty in the making of the film to be able to speak the language because through AD work, I was able to, you know, look at a lighting crew and say, OK, you got 20 minutes. How are we going to make this happen? You know? Uh, you're looking at, you know, um, just any kind of like creative work and say, okay, how can we practically achieve this, this amorphous creative idea that's in the script? Um, and I think that kind of practical, you know, application is what I really learned from that time. Oh, yeah. Invaluable. So let's yeah. switch into documentary films. So yeah, um, can you tell me you know, why you chose to go into documentary filmmaking. We had just, for one of the great storytellers, we just, I just interviewed Jackie Olive from Always um, mm -hmm. in Season. And you know, she's we, great. She's yeah. amazing. She's one of our alumni. She's fantastic. I was so honored to be able to speak to her. Um, but she worked on the documentary for 10 years of her life. And so yes. documentary and film uh, and narrative filmmaking are really different beasts in a way. And so um, you went from one to another and I wanted to know um, why you decided to take that path. I think just like with her and her project, you know, I think people choose to do documentaries because it's a piece of them, mm. you know, um, and the story that had happened, you know, in near my hometown, it was a piece of me. Mm. And that's what gets me up every morning to, to continue. Mm. And I'm sure that's why she got up every morning for 10 years to continue making because documentary is for, for those who, you know, I, I don't speak to it for everyone, but especially for people of color and minorities, like it's, 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 a, it's about something that's so inherent to a piece of you. Um, and that is what drives you um, to be passionate, to keep working on it. You know, I'm still working on my film and I began in early 2017, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm considered a young project in the grand scheme of, you know, the uh, you know, project, doc projects. But I think for me, it, it, narrative film can be, can feel like it can be constrained, can, you know, uh, can constrain you a little bit just because you need the crew, you need equipment, you need all these things to get you to a place where you can film the frame. Um, documentary, you can use this guy right here, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as long as the story um, that you're capturing has emotion and just incredible, you know, depth. It can be, it can, you can go out and shoot a proof of concept today, you mm -hmm. know, with whatever you have. Um, and that's what I loved about it. And I was coming off of a time where I was like, I was trying to get the next narrative project going and, you know, doing labs were all great, but I'm like, I just want to, want to make something. And, and this thing had happened near my hometown. And I just thought this, you know, what a great thing to, to do if we could just go capture what it feels like in the now. Um, and that's what I love about documentary. And it's also real people in real lives. That can be daunting because I think about them too. And I'm very, I feel like, you know, they've entrusted me with so much of their real life and what they're going through. Um, but also in the same, um, in the same kind of way, it's daunting, but it's also inspiring because it's real. You know, people were heroic in this, in these stories and you have to, you can't help but just feel 
like you know you're honoring them by continuing to make a project like that well yeah so it's sharpening too because i love i looked i actually filmed a lot of my own documentary mm -hmm. and i have people come on too to help but you know like if i want to put the camera somewhere i stood there you know if i wanted to sh you know try a frame out it was all very immediate and i thought that was also really great because it informed my narrative filmmaking mm. in a way that i didn't expect quite honestly oh yeah and so tell us about i mean the film that's close to your heart that you're discussing yeah so this project it's called a town called victoria and uh, it's about a mosque in victoria texas that was unfortunately burned down uh, the night that the travel ban was enacted in uh, 2017. Um, it made you know national international headlines because this was kind of the first big thing that had happened after the inauguration and people were kind of trying to feel out what these next four years might look like for people of color and minorities um, and being a person of color from texas myself i think i really knew and felt like I was close to uh, a little bit of the fear and just a little bit, you know, of their experience, you know, growing up there myself. And so very soon after I, I tried to, you know, get some, you know, volunteers together it was truly voluntary and a little bit of money so I can, you know, feed people and, and put them up someplace to just shoot a little bit of a, you know, of, of a piece just to say, you know, this is what had happened. And the community was so great to actually wrap its arms around this community in need at that time through peace rallies and you know, donations towards their new building. And I felt like that was also a piece of what makes me proud to be from Texas too. And that's the other side of the stereotype. Um, so it started off with that. And it was a three day shoot to begin with that then culminated into, you know, a project that I'm still working on today. We went back and we filmed over a hundred plus days on in Victoria with them ultimately. And we actually captured, you know, everything from the destruction of the original mosque to the grand opening of the new one, which, you know, thankfully happened in uh, 2019, I think. Um, so it was, it was really interesting, you know, to be able to, you know, look back on it now and say, if I'd known it'd be a three-year project, maybe I would have thought a little bit more about diving in, but I'm glad I didn't think about it that way and just did it because it was it was something that I was passionate about. Oh my gosh, that's such an interesting thing. I mean, because that's the same thing, like, you know, with my feature that's taken seven years. It's like, would yeah. I have done this if, if, if I knew that it was going to take this long? And, yeah. you know, me and Chloe were speaking about last week is that what people yeah. don't know and what I impart on students in general is that filmmaking is a marathon especially if you're going into narratives and docs and series in that sense. I mean, I guess yeah. television is still a marathon, but it's not like a passion project that you keep for years and years and years. And um, that's what I think is the most difficult part of filmmaking, in, in my opinion, is having that stamina. And the only thing that really drives you is your passion. Absolutely. And that's a not, you know, it's an honest conversation to have with yourself because that is kind of the fuel that you run on, mm -hmm. you know, and like for your own films, for your, even if you, it doesn't matter what stage of career you're in, you're still going to have to have that sense of like, oh, this is something that means something to me and it's going to be worth me living in for the next X amount of years, who knows, you know, so is this story going to be something I'm going to be passionate about for? pretty long time you know and feel like can speak to me for a pretty long time so yeah i think that's definitely you know what we face as filmmakers and artists yeah so um lee and i spoke on at a baa conference last year i think it was the first uh, minority women in film conference that i had led last year at the las vegas mm -hmm. um conference and you know one thing that we talked about was this annenberg report from usc which i really do love and i mentioned it last week and i wanted to ask you about this lee so us uh the top 1200 films um in uh, 2016 2018 the direct uh the male directors out of number of women directors was 22 to 1 out of 1335 directors six percent were black and 3.1 percent were asian um to break it down even further <laughs> out of 80 black directors five were female and out of 42 asian directors three were female so you got you're a creative storyteller and so how does that affect you as a filmmaker and what has been your biggest obstacle in getting your message out as a storyteller 
Well, then the proof is in the pudding. Those are the numbers, mm -hmm. right? And I think subconsciously, just being on a lot of sets, you just, you feel those stats more than you know them, mm -hmm. like in your mind as a fact, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think for the most part, and I'm, I'm speaking to kind of, you know, jobs like the TV episode that I got to do, which was so great. And like, just to be, being in that space is like, half the battle you know mm -hmm. being on set you know like showing up literally represent like representing in a way uh is is progress i think you know if, I, if i'm on a set and i see other women and people of color and people that you know look like look like how the world looks like how our country looks like it it really feels great you know especially if i see people you know for example the pas on set you know they're getting more and more diverse as time goes on. I think that's so great. I remember like when I was PA, like sometimes being the only, you know, woman, being the only person of color, blah, blah, blah. And just feeling like, okay, you know, I got to prove myself in a way. And in those certain cer circumstances, you can feel like that. And I think it's actually great that you feel like, okay, well, there's only one of me here and I'm going to do great. <laughs> you know, I'm going to show them that I, I, I earned this spot. Um, but, um, I think it drives me more when I see other people that look like me and have my experience on set more and more these days. And so I feel like those numbers, they are changing for sure, you know, and just the, even the fact that there are numbers to look at of that kind is a sign that we are trying to bring more visibility to the inequity, you know, that, um, that occurs. And you asked me about like, how does... Give you an give you an example about some about that experience. Yeah, I mean, what has been just kind of in general, what has been your obstacle in getting your story out to the masses because of this situation? Because of um, I have to say, recently it's actually been really an advantage mm -hmm. because it tells people you have a point of view. Right. Your point of view is unique. It's special. It's filled with you know something that is quite you know. Uh, it's different and it's also interesting right because these are voices that are so you know had been sold and heard in the media from before um but also i have to advocate you know in state even if it's not your own project or what have you like even just being in the room is such a huge thing like if you're keeping a writer in a writer's room or just someone on set you know like if they're trying to tell a story from their community or from another community that you know you know a little bit a little bit more than the, the you know the most of the crew does you are there to say hey i think that painting goes there or hey i think this is upside down you know oh hey i think we should add you know something here to say this because you know if your characters are this then it's you know they would probably be thinking about that and i've found many examples of that in my work where i'm like oh you know, if I wasn't here, I, you know, no one would say this. And it's not because it's coming from a place of, you know, maliciousness or just whatever. They just, they just don't have that person in the voice to say, oh, okay, like this is not how, this is not correct culturally to whatever space or theme that we're talking about. And just being there in the room is just like, that, those are the moments I feel like I've been like, thank goodness, <laughs> you know, thank goodness for, for, the potential viewer on the other side, um, you know, to, to not go, they got it wrong, you know? Um, and that makes me feel proud that, you know, at least I'm there to do, to say that. For sure. What do you think has been the biggest push for the reason why there's more stories of uh, people of color and of women? I think, honestly, I think it's audiences. Like we are, we consume TV, we consume films and, other kinds of art forms and media and we want we want at this point we want to see ourselves represented i think growing up whenever there was someone that looked like you and i we'd be like oh how lucky <laughs> you know we had this sense of like oh cool there was a 
there was someone that looked like me that wasn't a complete stereotype. Even if it was a stereotype, sometimes I'd be like, oh, these are someone that looks like me. Yeah, I was super excited with all the stereotypes that happened. <laughs> and Aladdin, yeah. and like, <laughs> Back to the Future. I'm like, oh, that Muslim is shooting something, but like, we're on TV. It's so terrible. Yeah, yes. yeah but that's like, to put into context for, you know, for younger generations, like, that's how it was to be like, oh, cool, like Jackie Chan, like doing Kung Fu or whatever. <laughs> like, cool, you know, like, oh, cool. I get to hear like you know Mandarin sp spoken on you know national TV. That's kind of cool, but we've gotten from there to being like so grateful to being like demanding. Like, no, we sh this is not how we are. Like we, not all of us like have fit into these stereotypes. We're not really true. So you know I I think that's the change in time, and and as we find our voices, and also for you know the the second generation, third generation, even if you're, you know, um, immigrant yourself, you, you, I, I feel like the, there's something about now that makes you, makes people feel like, you know, yeah, I'm here and I'm just as American as you are and I'm different in these ways and I'm proud of them. And I want to see that reflected. If you're going to reflect reality in your TV show, then I want to make sure that fits to this, you know, two way street. Agreed. Agreed. 100%. So, um, I'm going to do this thing where I ask the same questions like James Lipton um, to each female filmmaker, but what was your best experience on a film set and why? <gasps> okay. Uh, let's think. I can't remember a specific like incident, but I think I remember a feeling like, you know, on, for the documentary, there's been, there've been some certain times where I really felt like, I really felt like, I was asking questions that someone had been waiting for someone to, you know, ask them in a way. They were just trying to express something that's truthful to them. And somehow I was able to meet them on that wavelength and, and they were, I asked that question and, or just we were having a conversation about something that they were trying to find a way to articulate for themselves and for, you know, for others. But, those moments of like deep connection, I think, are my favorite. Um, and that, that and that's the same kind of feeling as when you're on set and you're working with an actor and you're trying to like thread through. Here's a good one. Like I was on The Resident, the TV show that I did, and I had this great chance to work with Bruce Greenwood, who's like a veteran actor and had been in so many things that I admire. And we we're trying to figure out a way for him and the patient um, uh, in the episode to connect, you know, he's kind of his backstory that he was a kind of doctor who, a uh, surgeon who was getting back into this idea of, you know, okay, I can care for my patients and show a softer side to myself. And there was a patient that was refusing a certain operation, um, because he was, you know, in danger of losing, losing his voice and his voice was the thing that he liked best about himself. And we're trying to find a physical way to, 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 to show that bond in a kind of um, nonverbal way. And we found what that was. And it was just something, something very light, like a touch on the arm or mm -hmm. something. But I, in those moments, I feel like on set, when, when you find something, I think that's so exciting and mm -hmm. so memorable because it's real. What you found was real, you know, and, and everyone kind of, can meet you on that wavelength and tune into that together. I think that's why people love films. You know, it's like, how do we find that real thing that's kind of intangible and capture it somehow? Um, so yeah, those moments are my favorites. That's so, great. And it, so, yeah. well, even I automatically think, okay, well, how are you going to cover that moment? Right? Like sure. what, sh what shots are you going to get? I was like, oh, that's a great moment, but it's not going to make sense if you don't cover it correctly. And so when you're yeah. on television, um, as a director, I know it's a little bit different, uh, in terms of coverage, like with the cinematographer, is that something that the cinematographer takes care of, or do you work with the cinematographer in the shots design? You definitely work with the cinematographer. Mm -hmm. Um, it depends on what show each show, I think is a different kind of, you know, home in a way with its own rules and, you know, power structures. And I do have to say in TV, you know, it's, it, it's, it's for the better, I think, that the director isn't the point person to really lead the charge on everything in the TV show. You have a whole uh, um, ecosystem of people that work on that show, you know, night, day to night. That's what they 
breathe in for a whole season of TV that know the show better than you, have created these characters in this world, and you are the dinner guest that gets to come over and help, help tell perhaps, you know, a good chapter of that story. Um, but you definitely work with the cinematographer, you know, you plan out your coverage. On this show, it was very important also just to have enough coverage because at the end of the day, you'll have your days in the edit to finish um, your director's cut four days. But after that, it it's not, it, you release it back to the show. And the show and the people who run the show um, need to sort of have that malleability to, to get certain moments. Because they're, they're also knowing things that you don't know. Like maybe in three episodes from now, this character has this or whatever. So they're, they're, they're trying to look at the overall umbrella of the show and make choices. So you better have your coverage. You know, the worst thing you can do in TV is um, for certain kinds of shows is just is to not get enough coverage so that when they need that and they don't have it, it's probably not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Does it go back on you as the director of the television show if the coverage is bad? 100%. Really? 100%. I mean, the DP is not going to like, he or she is not going to not, you know, do a good job. But ultimately, you know, there's certain, you know, some people think they can flex and be like, no, I don't want this shot because I'm the director on set and this is my episode. And that person probably will be in hot bath water, you know, later on in the edit. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, this is not how I approach TV stuff. It's like everyone, like I've been on sets to know this in my heart. And I think that's why this first experience for me was good. Like everyone on set is there trying to make this the best, you know, the best they can be as well. They're trying to help you. No one's against you, you know? People have this idea like, oh, I have to come in and just like, you know, really push people to make this great. They want to make a great too, you know? I don't think anyone works in, I, you know, most people work, to, you know, don't really seek a career in film and TV to like be lazy about it or, or not do a great job, you know? Every once in a while, you will run into the person who is a little difficult, but there's ways to deal with that too. Um, but, you know, it's, I think knowing that, knowing everyone is there, you know, at work, doing their best, and your job is to facilitate them and bring out the best in everyone and not take, you know, a zillion hours to shoot the thing because you got kids, you know? That's, that's also very important. Like, yeah. like the, the, the real life balance to what you want to do as an artist. You know, if that's that's something that I think is really good to clue into early on in your career, you know. Well, that's also um, something important we had spoken to Chloe about. Before I go into that, I do want to open it up to questions. Um, keep in mind, there is a 40 second lag. So if you ask a question, which I will ask to Lee, um, it'll be 40 seconds later. But please, please open up questions because we are or ask questions because that's the whole point of the live. Um, hey. So. <laughs> Am I? Okay, sorry, the comments. Um, so, uh, question, oh, about life, uh, family life. So that's a really yeah. important question. So I was yeah. telling um, Chloe last week, who is who is now pregnant, I don't know if you know. I know, and that's, yes, really congrats to her, she, she looks great. It's, it's very yeah. exciting, it's that, you know, she, she looked at her calendar, and this was for me or anyone else, who yeah. we we're traveling constantly. And yeah. I looked at my professors that were teaching me in film school. They were either um, in the industry, they were either divorced or they didn't have kids or they were alone. And so especially us as, you know, women filmmakers, you know, uh, we always call, I always call it the mental load, like having kids and traveling and all that stuff at the same time, you know, what yeah. balance do you choose? And, you know, choosing between your art and your family, like where does that line draw? And so like, what are your thoughts about that? I think when you're young or just when whatever and you know insert whatever you want into that I think when you're at a certain mindset or stage in in this life as an artist you have this romantic idea that like you know oh I will give it my all like I don't care if I eat you know crackers for a year as long as I get to make films and do my art and you know this kind of like all in approach to stuff and while that is romantic i don't think it's sustainable nor do i feel like it's helpful or you know, to your art mm -hmm. um i really try to uh keep a reality check at all times you know i filmmaking is a big passion of mine it's a huge part of my life 
but filmmaking is nothing if I don't have a life. That's a good point. Mm, that's you know, was, yeah. what inspires you as a, as a human being? You know, what what if you're trying to repl replicate reality in life or what have you in your work, you got to know what that is, right? So having a family is important to me, and you know, being in a stable relationship is important to me, and you know, taking care of my family they're important to me and my mental health especially in a time like now like you know everyone's like oh everyone should be writing scripts and da, 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 da. i'm like you know what i rarely have time to just be and read a book or go outside for a hike or whatever i'm 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 just gonna take this this gift of time for for inspiration to to, to fill up that a little bit you know mm -hmm. and maybe that'll turn into something creative right but i'm, I'm not setting out just to say, okay, Lee, I'm gonna, you know, you're gonna sit down today, you're gonna write that screenplay. There's discipline involved, of course, you know. And some people can write every day, some people like to do it in one fell swoop. That's your process. But I think what I'm trying to say is like within your process, just don't, you know, don't forget that there is a world out there that is there to inspire you. So when you do sit your butt down to write something, it's got something to it. Nice. So, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> that is really great. Okay, so we got two questions here. Hi, Miss Lou. I'm a young filmmaker and I'm wondering what advice you have for students who may have doubts about having success in their careers or the ability to make a living. That's part one. And then part two is also, do you have advice on how to seek summer experiences with production companies or filmmakers? Great questions. Um, I'm assuming this is a student yeah. currently in the program. Um, I mean, I. I have to say, and this is this is a really hard industry, you know. And being a Chinese American, my parents were like, "This ain't happening," <laughs> you know. After like three years after graduating, you know, they were happy that I was making money and you know, getting stable work. But you know, my mom's like, "Oh, we didn't come to America for you to like, you know, stand on your feet for twelve hours and be dehydrated in the desert somewhere." <laughs> and it was really hard to get them you know, on board. And now that like, you know, things have been, you know, pretty great. And I'm very lucky now that they, they see that, that it's hard work as well, but it, it takes a lot of like mental resilience, I think. And I think it's a conversation you have to have with yourself about like, what is it about this that really excites you about passion that we talked about, right? Because that passion is going to be your fuel to burn through the hard times and the good, you know, like, even even at my highest points i remember like you know all the low points and my lowest points i have to remember my high points it's a lot of like internal and mental preparation to know that success for me success is really you know it, it can only happen if you've tried and failed like a million times okay. you know with people okay. say oh you got lucky like luck is just the fact that you were there trying again right agreed you know what i mean 100%. so i think i think all the like oh my this person did it this way they got lucky and i'm gonna just copy what they did i don't think that works you know i think you have to find your own path but who you are that's the rock solid foundation to any of this stuff um and as for summer you know internships or program i mean i this is the mindset i had while at film school i didn't have any free time at all i would just volunteer to crew for any kind of project student projects indie films i was not afraid to get out there and just soak up as much as i could um for free some you know when i was a student because that, i knew that i didn't have much to offer and i was there to learn so i really suggest crewing um on film sets if you're not interested in physical production maybe you want to be an executive or maybe an agent or writing or whatever like there's ways to get into those worlds for internships at production companies um you writing you can you know writing is the easiest one i think you, you can write with the group you know find some other aspiring writers and make yourself you know responsible to each other and every tuesday you have to write five pages okay great you know um so i think there's ways in which you can make yourself available to learn um it's a little tough right now because we're all kind of locked down and who knows how long it'll be but in the meantime it's always great to connect with others who are kind of in the same boat as you are um to you know to talk about you know what you guys want to do after this whole thing is lifted 
Well, I too. think she's actually, I mean, like how, how would you speak about further about actually making money in the industry to sustain a career? Well, money, just like any other job, when you come out of school is hard, right? Like, you know, when you're PA, if you want to work on set as a PA, you get paid. You know, if you want to work it as an assistant, you can get paid. I mean, these are all jobs or jobs, right? Um, but ultimately, what I think about money, I think about the what it's attached to, right? I want to be paid because I want to direct. You know, that's where I want my money to come in. Mm -hmm. So what do I need to do in my career to make sure the money that comes in is from directing mm -hmm. and not, you know, AD work at this point, at this point in my career, right? right? right. Um, money is money. You got to pay the bills. Plenty of you know uh, other uh, film fellow filmmakers do things like workshops. They teach as well. You know they do um, side hustles. They some some of my producers when they make line item budgets for films that need a budget. Some ads just make schedules and you know other people have different you know side hustles and everything. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to feel like oh I'm not just doing this one thing to make money. Like we're all just kind of piecing it all together, you know? I think um, that's a really, actually a really great point. And I like that you use those examples because people don't realize that it is about the side hustle in order to get your passion through. And again, yeah. how, how much are, how much are you willing to do in the side hustle to go through it? And it, yeah. and another thing that is also, it takes a very long time, you know, it takes um, five to 10 years for you to get into that to that space. Like I've, my colleagues were writers, PAs for like six to seven years before became, they became staff. Right. And, right, right. and, and they're in their thirties. And so it took them to their forties until they got to be writers on TV shows, but they stayed the course. And so yeah. I think that's something really important to know. Yeah. If they, and, and the, 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 I want to just like blow up any kind of like fantasy about what an artist is, you know, like this idea like, Oh, like, wow, this one, a student like made an indie film and then got an agent right away and did the right. like uh, 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 no you know? like, a, yes. it's messy it's gonna get messy it's gonna get you're gonna have to podgepodge things together to make rent and make your bills but that's just part of the struggle because I hope that you love this so much that you just want to keep going at it you know yeah, for <laughs> so sure. this idea this romantic idea of what success looks like or like oh if i don't make this amount of money at this point after graduation maybe it's, there's no math to this there's no like you know steps to success which makes it hard for you and for you know your loved ones because they can't quantify where you are in the whole process of stuff at times but you just gotta keep gotta keep trying yeah for sure so yeah. Leah miranda asks where do you seek funding to produce your documentary work Great question. Um, documentaries, even though they are hard to make, they thankfully have a whole avenue of grants, um, either through private foundations or organizations or nonprofits or even sometimes the government or, and then entities like PBS and all of that. Because documentaries, I think, are a kind of film and filmmaking that serve a greater good in some kind of context, you need to figure out, okay, what themes does my uh, documentary touch on? And you can find organizations and entities who, who do give grants to filmmakers to help them along. Um, a great place to search is just the website for the um, International Docu Documentary Association, the IDA. They have a master list of all grants there, and they kind of – I think they might, have, might break it up into like their due dates and all of that. Mm -hmm. So the IDA is great, um, but then other organizations, you know, the Sundances, Film Independence, you know, um, IFPs of the world um, are also good as well. But it, it all depends on what kind of film you want to make. Say you are really passionate about, you know, the environment. There's a whole slew of grants that are open to ish to, to documentaries that particularly focus on you know, environmental issues and all of that. So, so yeah, I think that's, that's a great thing about it. And, and it's not, you're not going to be able to make a whole film from one of those grants unless you're very lucky. Um, but it's piecemealing all those grants together and a long rigorous grant process for some 
you'll, you'll feel like you're applying for college again, which at least I did for some of us. But but I think what what you'll get on the on the, on the other side of that is the great opportunity to uh, to make your film, which is what you want. And also in terms of grants, because we're so used to writing those, is that once you have like a template of what your grant is, you're able to kind of send them out to the to the 20 and 30s. But you just have to make sure that that first one is the template is strong, you know, in a sense. So. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's just like your essays for college, you know, like you gotta <laughs> send it out to a couple people, you know, make some tweaks and all of that. But, uh, but yeah, the hard work will be at the beginning. Well, and going on to more to the, the grant work in the application, what do you personally think? I mean, I know it is as a grant director, but what do you personally think is what will get you the grant? I think it's about how you relate to the story and how you want to tell it that comes from a very genuine and deep place. You know, um, in documentary, there was and there still is sometimes some, some work that you can tell was made by someone who was just plopped, plopped into that situation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a kind way of saying someone telling the story of a person of color or just some kind of, you know, some some story in a very clinical, like anthropological way that, that isn't doesn't feel come, coming from within. And I think so much of this time period now is about finding people who can tell the story from another point of view from within uh, and, and show a deeper sense of understanding and empathy. Um, and I think that's what's important, you know, having helped you with some grants at this point, you know, reading the applications yes. and whatnot. And I have to say, you know, that you organize your without your organization helping my project first, we would have never gotten far because it does take an early believer for these projects to get going. So thank you. That's the Islamic Scholarship Fund, which I'm the director of. Um, and I'm so happy to hear that because that was the point of the, the fund. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I agree with you in terms of the grant, um, reading hundreds of grant proposals. It's like, uh, and you think when I'm making grants, when I'm applying to grants myself, <laughs> because I'm a grant director, <laughs> I would do this. But like, it's always, you can tell what is so ingenuine right that it's just like typed out or if it's someone's heart on the page and that's what i would impart to you guys as students is put your heart on the page on the passion of the story and that's really what's going to pull you through yeah why do you care you know people want to know why why do you want to it's a question you want to because you know the, the best way that i think someone had explained it to me this wonderful woman tracy holder uh, who came to one of our uh, a doc uh like initiative or cohort a meeting is that she said like use the application to figure out for yourself mm. the filmmaker why you want to tell this story mm. let the grant application process actually be part of your development for yourself to figure out okay how am i going to tell this story why do i want to tell what's important and i think reframing that not just like oh, i have to like type a paragraph <laughs> i think reframing how you think of grants in the lifespan of the project will ch change so much about you know what you think of it and then the, the, the feeling you have when you have to sit down and type all those words. But, but yeah. that, that, that really has stayed with me. For sure. All right, guys, keep the questions coming. We about um, a little bit less than 20 minutes. Um, Sherry Zhao says, thanks and great to join the event at this special time. Thank you, Sherry. Roy Wall says, yes, so agreed. Exceptions do make rules. Rules are there to be broken. <laughs> okay, Absolutely. for sure. Yeah. Um, and then going back to Terry's second, um, Tatum's second question, which was, do you have advice on how to seek summer experiences with production companies or filmmakers? Um, I wonder, does the school have any kind of, you know, way to post internships or whatnot? Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, yes, we do post the internships. Yeah. I will say though, you know, the CJC, which, you know, I'm, I'm working on too, is a very much, um, uh, uh, journalism type of college so yeah. uh, and Gainesville is very small so there's not much narrative work happening around here for sure you know what I would actually say this I would contact your state or closest cities uh, film commission mm -hmm. we have a good film commission. commissions know right that all of the um, local production companies in town um, if you're looking for production company or on set work you know um, yeah that would be my suggestion you know or you know there's with in the world of social networking you know whether, whether it be through facebook or instagram whatever just seeing what kind of companies are out there uh close to you if you want to get a hands-on experience 
Um, if you if you're willing to travel to you know a bigger hub like Atlanta is close to you guys, um, LA, New York, of course, but that that takes a little bit of more resources, and I can understand as a student where you don't you wouldn't think that would be accessible to you. But um, I wonder if some I'm not sure. Like I, I knew someone had a remote internship once where they were just reading scripts and doing coverage and things like that. Um, but it's up to the company, you know. And and I would, and just a word to, to the wise about these internships: make sure you're learning something. If they're making you take out the trash or just like doing whatever, that's not an internship. That's free labor, and you should stand up for yourself. Um, yeah. It's so interesting that you say that, Lee, because I always. Say <laughs> like if you are taking out the coffee uh, or getting the coffee, you are creating the relationship with the person that will bring you to the next level. Do you think that there's That's not value funny. in you? You're going to get a lot of coffee for a lot of people. That's yeah. fine. But if all of your internship consists of like other stuff and you're not, and if, they're, if, if they're not saying, Hey, get the coffee, but also sit in on the meeting, mm. you know, you get the coffee, but also like, you know, read the script, you know, or, or you're, you know, look at the, like, if, if it's not, if you're, if you're not gaining anything, and I think it will be very apparent if you're not being included, um, that's not an internship, you know. There was a case a couple of years ago with the movie Black Swan, mm. where some, in, some, some interns that had gone to business school, so, like, you know, business school internships are much more, you know, luxurious compared to ours, but they were, you know, interning on that film, and I think they were just, they weren't getting anything inside the lens of how to what, what this production was and i think they actually sued and won um uh, because their internship was basically just a, a guise for free labor but you know this is how i feel about a lot of things like no one's going to respect you unless you respect yourself so if there's something that you want say your internship is like it's pretty good you know they're sending some things out and whatever say you really want to be a part of their weekly meeting as a company or if you want to be a part of hey i want to go visit that set you got to ask the question, you know, the worst thing they'll say is no. And that's fine. You know, like I, I think I've, I've, I've been forcing myself to be brave in instances in, in, in every step of the way, just to say like, Hey, I wonder if I just asked the question, they'll just say yes. You know? Uh, and so I implore everyone to be a little brave and ask, ask questions outside of your comfort zone. You never know. Yeah, for sure. Okay, guys, yeah. keep the questions coming. Um, what do you think is um, the best way for someone that's just graduating, that's like 22, to discover what is the best avenue for them to go into, which is like either it could be art department or producing or whatnot? I get that question a lot. Hmm. I would try everything that interests you, you know? Um, I think the number one thing maybe is to think of is like, do I want to be on set or not? Mm. That life, as I'm sure Chloe had talked about, is long and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of time and energy that you put into being on set with other people for a long time, but it's exciting. You know, I say it's, it's, it's where the, all the magic does happen. Um, if that's not really your, you know, if you, if you don't feel like being on set and being with others at all times is kind of, you know, what you want to do, you know, think about is writing, you know, more your kind of what, you know, um, place to be. Yeah. Uh, and also writing can be different. You can be with a partner, it can be in a room full of other people. You know, there's different kinds of like social uh, degrees of social kind of interaction with what you want to do and what you feel like you're confident in. Um, but I, if you want to be a director, you know, I, I would say no one comes out of the box just like directing a lot, right? I just, I felt like after film school, I didn't know anything about directing and I needed to learn. Mm. So I would, you know, figure out, figure out an avenue that interests you as the thing that would really pivot your way towards directing. Um, and there's no one, no right answer to that. It's just whatever interests you and what kind of lifestyle rhythm you want to have. You know, more, or if it, if you feel like you know, you know, it might be best suited to be an executive, someone that works at a film company, a production company, and has really good taste and can be a leader from that side to amplify and you know make great films with great artists. That's a role too. That's not that's a role that no one ever talk talked talk to me about mm. in film school because we're all just like, oh, I gotta go out there and make Creative, films. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's also very important because well, who are we if we don't have someone on the other side 
that sees and values what we do. Right. And, and I think it's very different now. Like before executives were just the guys in the suits that were the naysayers, but that's not the case anymore, especially at the Netflixes and the Hulus and whatnot. They're a part, they're yeah. us. That they're ones that are the actually, part. they're, they're one, they're the ones that are pushing the story of the, um, the minority story. So that's, that's yeah. really important. Absolutely. So um, Maria Solano says, thank you so much for doing this. It's been very inspiring to hear your story as a female um, POC filmmaker. You've been so helpful with all your advice. I almost don't have any questions, but I wanted to know how you see filmmaking in the future in terms of minority representation and the virus. So I guess those are separate. For minority representation, I think it's just about, you know, really, really demanding your story to be told authentically whatever that might mean for the particular story, you know, um, and to stand up for things that are touching upon stereotype or any kind of harmful representation is to stand up for those things. Um, I don't, I feel like there's a lot of like, oh, like, oh, let's write it this way, but maybe it's too this or too this, this idea that it's too blank. And I, I resist that because I think people want you to be as unique as you are. Um, and I think, again, if you walk in respecting yourself, respecting your story and coming out with a script that is just uniquely and unapologetically you, I think people will really clue in and respect that, you know. So I just think you just go for it and push boundaries, push boundaries that you feel like haven't been pushed before. That's what excites me, you know, about what we do. And in terms of this virus, I've been thinking about this a lot because, you know, I'm thinking about film sets and how they can be safer. Um, and and I do have to say on the top, you know, on, from the top uh, in terms of the guilds and the way that they're doing things, they are actually formulating ways in which film sets should be uh, regulated and run mm -hmm. from a top down approach yeah. so that so that they are taking care of their own people. So that's good. Um, but for, for independent productions and things that's still up to the producers and still up to the people kind of like, you know, setting up how the project is being made. And for that, I just think, you know, film sets are such communal places. We touch everything, <laughs> you know, we pass props back and forth and people, it's, it's a, it's an intimate space. And, and I do feel like, you know, for films to be made, we do have to be very, very safe and secure. Um, and, uh, and, and give ourselves some time, but you know, simple things like how food is made and passed out, you know, uh, in a more kind of streamlined individual way. Um, there, I've heard some things of film sets not being more than 50 people. Some, I, I saw an initiative, yeah. I think in Europe, right. Mm -hmm. Um, which is interesting, you know, um, I think, yeah, definitely, um, it, it, the thing is, like with with stuff like that, I think it, it'll just affect how much work you do a day, and 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 then for the crew and the project to understand with okay, with if we can only have thirty people, we're only going to be able to do this amount of work per day, and that's going to be okay. I just don't want these arbitrary restrictions to feel like oh, we're solving a problem, but we're creating more. Right. Good point. Yeah. You know, so the number one thing I think is just patience. You know, we want to make sure everyone's healthy and safe overall. So we might have to wait a little bit longer than we want, but you know, it's fine. Don't worry, everyone. I know you're graduating in a time where for the ones that are graduating, it feels like it's like, oh, it's the end of the world, but it's all right. You know, there's there's plenty of ebb and flow to be had in your career. And this this is, you're coming out strong as you've survived a pretty big thing already. Really great point. All right, so Paula yeah. says, thank you, Iman and Ms. Lou, for sharing your insight and advice. It means a lot to us as upcoming graduates during this difficult time. Thank you, Paula. So Churchill Roberts, um, who's one of our professors and a fantastic documentarian, he's asking, I'm interested in how Asian actors in US motion pictures are perceived by persons of Asian descent. For example, what did you think of Constance Wu's portrayal in Crazy Rich Asians and Hustlers? By the way, one of my good friends is Mark Harris at USC. He visited UF several times. Terrific writer and director. I'm not sure if you work with Mark Harris, but yes. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. Okay. So his question is about how I feel about Asian American characters being portrayed in me in films. Yeah, and pers pers specifically, he said Constance Wu's Crazy Rich Asian and Hustlers, her character in both of those. Look, I, I think characters are characters. You know, if you are, if you happen to be Asian and you happen to be, you know, whatever, 
it's interesting to that character's backstory, but you're also not representing a whole people through just being on screen as yourself. You know, Crazy Rich Asians was a fun rom-com that I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, that it was really fun and just, you know, a great summer film. And Constance Wu's character was an interesting way because she was, you know, an American-born Chinese, no, she was just Chinese-American, but seeing the world through fresh eyes, which then became the audience's point of view. And Hustler's like, yeah, it's great to see that, you know, she's defying stereotypes of being this, you know, the stripper in this film uh, and carrying that role. Um, but I think that's, you know, it's, I think that's great. I think that actors should be able to portray whatever role they want as long as it's authentic to the character and the story, you know? Um, I, 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 there was a great New York Times piece that came out um, a couple of years ago where a, a, a huge swath of Asian American actors had talked about, you know, their experiences in casting and in the projects. And I remember Ken Jeong, he had a quote in that article saying, you know, I, there's this one role that I got cast and just as like a funny person. And I was so happy when I got that role because it was just a funny person, not a funny Asian guy you know, not a doctor, not a this or that. I was just being cast because it was because of my talent, you know? And I think that's also the other side of it is to say like, yeah, like, wouldn't that be great if we could just play characters and not have to feel like we, you know, have to, because the, the thing with Crazy Rich Asians, some people are like, oh, it doesn't really represent us. It's not like this and that. I don't think, I didn't think it was trying to represent the plight of Asian and American, like, you know, Asian American, you know, issues as a social group. I think it was just trying to be a really good film, which I thought was fine. And but it was also great because but to celebrate people that look like us in a really well made film. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of how I lens, you know, representation. Because yeah, we just want to take it away from the things that we had seen in the past through stereotyping and things like you know, yellow face and all of that. Right, of course. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so we got three minutes left. So I'm going to ask this one. Uh, Maria is asking again. She, I have all these stories I want to tell as a director and filmmaker, but writing isn't my strongest point. I plan on keeping working on it, but I'd like to know how possible it is to still be an individual creative as a director that isn't the one who wrote the story. Yeah, totally possible. You know, I, I think there are plenty of people who recognize that writing is not something they're passionate about or feel like they want to do. And and, I'm, and and what surprised me is that, you know, I think there was a certain point when I realized, oh, there's writers that feel the same way about directing. Like, I would never want to direct or never want to, like, you know, be at the helm of actually making this, you know, come into fruition. So I think it's just about finding with that partnership. You know, I think partnerships when you come out of school are very important it can be a collective of very like-minded you know artists that have shared taste share you know camaraderie and then really like forcing each other to like band together and make films and swap roles too you know sometimes I, there's a great group of young filmmakers that i know that you know they all shoot each other's you know projects they film they take turns filming and writing and doing music and editing and stuff and I think that's so great. You know, I think, you know, that that's, that's hopefully what film school was for you is to find people that you felt like, oh, simpatico with and you wanted to continue creating with, with them. Well, that's always a question too, is, I mean, this is an undergraduate um, liberal, arts liberal arts college with a yeah. production track within a telecommunications major, um, yeah. is to go to film school or not to go to film school for your MFA. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about that? Depends on what you're looking for. You know, I've many friends have gone on to get their masters at places like AFI or you know USC or just a, a more kind of you know, concentrated um, film program, and they some of them really loved it, and some didn't, and they also are you know paying a lot of student loans and have debt. So I think it's just about what you want if you feel like that conservatory or that kind of like master's approach was more interesting usc also has a really good producing track 
um, Stark, the Stark program is two years, and it's, you know, if you want to be a producer, I think it's really good in and out. Um, because go, getting your master's is also not, not including the tuition, but like, you know, making your, you know, your thesis film and all of that and possibly moving somewhere else. It's not a light decision, but if you feel like you need that structure of school to put you through and make you grow as an artist and walk out with a, a film that you do feel proud about, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's good, but I hesitate because I just know how much money. <laughs> Because people say, hey, just save that money and make a film, um, which is, you know, a valid point. But I just I, I just suggest that people look at the things that aren't, you know, don't have such a heavy price tag in terms of time and money first. Writing, you know, there's tons of like, you know, script competitions that get your name out there and you're able to read scripts and like, you know, compare your work to others. Or if you want to make films, like, you know, shorts are still a great way to test out who you are as a filmmaker and get seen by a bigger audience. Um, you know, and, and, and if you want to do your master's, I think coming from the kind of the, the program that you just mentioned, I think it is a more concentrated way of perhaps meeting more people that are interested in film and film alone. So that might be nice, but there's all you can also get that experience maybe through like an intensive. I know USC has an intensive, maybe it's only for undergrad, I'm not sure, but these other these other entities have more kind of concentrated summer intensives that you can look at too. Uh, and you can decide whether or not you want to launch into another, you know, degree program. But it's hard. It's 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 up to what you what you want. I, I know from the debt that I stole, you know, that I went to USC and I'm good. You know, I, I think I, I, I maxed out my time um, in school. Um, but not to say that it's it's not a great choice for somebody else. Okay, we should close it down. I just want to read these last comments. Sherry Zhao says, I'm Churchill's colleague and we share a lot of things in common, although from different dis um, descents and cultural backgrounds. It is very interesting to see that crazy rich Asians were well received in the US, whereas intrigued a lot of resistance and debates in Asia. So what mm -hmm. would you say about this question of cultural authenticity as you have also addressed and its relationship to the spectators? Thanks. Depends on where you are. I am a Chinese American person. You know, I was able to let, to watch a film like that and enjoy it for what it was a rom com. You know, um, and it's about accessibility. You know, in China, I don't think people could really access that world because for them, you know, like the world of Singapore is also foreign to them, even though the people might be speaking Mandarin. That's a different country. You know, I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure how Singaporeans, you know, have reacted from the film. But from I think you know authenticity depends on what you're on who you are, right? Where are you authentically from? I'm authentically from you know I'm a Chinese American you know woman who grew up in Texas, and I enjoyed it, and so so did many of my friends. But not to say that someone else from a different background would feel that that it represents them or is authentic to them in, in a certain way. If that makes sense. I think it also goes to show, and I don't know how it is in the Asian American community, but in the Muslim American community, is that <laughs> the hater raid runs strong. Like, um, what we should be doing is supporting each other's work more also than instead of saying that doesn't re represent who I am, which everybody. Well, um, yeah, the, the, the film to me didn't need to be that. It wasn't right. supposed to be that, you know? It's, it's this thing that we could, because there's so few films of people that look like you and me, we have to feel like the film needs to do all these things and check all these boxes. It doesn't need to, it just needs to be a good film. You know, there's a, if I, if I want something that speaks out a certain issue about people that look like you and I, there's other films for that, but you know what I mean? Like there's, it, it, there's like tens, 10 other kind of films starring Caucasian cast about a whole plethora of things, but not one of the, one of those films is is pressured into needing to be the voice on a certain issue. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I think it's just about the more films we make, hopefully that pressure of representation can be alleviated a little bit. And also just pointing the point out, it's like, um, it's revolutionary that it, there is just a Hollywood high budget film that, what, that, that had people that were not just white, white men and women that were telling a rom-com right. story, right? right? So, I mean, there's so many different avenues of just, and it's, to me, it's sad that it took 2000 and 
whatever, 18 for it to come out in, in all these yeah. years when it looks like, you know, us. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, we went over. Lee, this was such a fantastic conversation. Thank you so, so, so much. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. hopefully it was helpful at all. You know, I'm glad and hang in there. That's all I could say. You know, it's a hard road, but you know what? I have to tell you that this is what you love, then you'll be glad that you stuck it out. Thank you so much, Lee. All right, yeah. take care. Yeah. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.